Hi everyone and welcome to today's lecture which will focus on first an introduction to ecology and then we'll narrow in and look at behavioral ecology. Now when we talk about ecology the first thing to ask yourself is what exactly do we mean by the term ecology and ecology is defined as the study of how organisms interact with each other and with their environment okay so interacting with other organisms and with the environment that's what we study in ecology now there are five levels of ecology and i want you to have a, an understanding of what each of them means we have in ecology the organism the population the community the ecosystem and the biosphere. And we're gonna go through each of these individually over the next few slides. Now over here, I put the figure from the textbook for you to see these five levels that we study in ecology. So when we're studying the organismal level of ecology, we look at how an in individual organism then interacts with other individual organisms okay as well as their environment then at the population level we're looking at a whole bunch of individuals of the same species and you know what makes that population change over time at the community level you're looking at how species interact and what happens based on those interactions and you notice now in this picture you have two different species so you're not just looking at that single species of fish now you're looking at for instance the predators of that species interacting with it then at the ecosystem level now you're looking at things like energy and nutrient flow and that's why you see now that individual is dead decomposing and in the ecosystem ecology we would study you know the nutrients that are then released and used by various other species multiple species of other organisms around them then global ecology is looking at the biosphere so it's more of an earth-wide kind of uh, study in terms of various populations and how things like global warming and climate change are affecting all of those worldwide populations okay now as promised we're going to go through these five terms that i really want you to know the difference between them so the first of those terms that we're looking at is the organism. And the definition of an organism is an individual. Okay, so you're looking at an individual. So it's a single species, a single individual, and you would be studying things such as their biology, their physiology, you know, what, what's going on in their body. Okay, what do they look like? How do they act? Then at the population level, what is a population? A population is now a group of those individuals, okay, a group of organisms of the same species living in the same area, okay, at that particular time. So you go from an individual organism to a population, and the difference now is that a population is many organisms, but please make note that they are all the same species in the same area, okay, during that time you're looking at. The difference now with the third term, a community. A community is made up of multiple populations that interact with each other, meaning a community has multiple different species. Okay, so I should be able to describe something and you should know which term I'm talking about. If I say multiple species interacting in the same area, that's now a community. If I say a single species interacting in an area, that's a population. Then we get to the term ecosystem. And what's important about the ecosystem is it's not just the organisms, okay? It's not just those species, those living individuals. Instead, now it also takes into account 
the non-living components, okay? So an ecosystem is all of the different species, but also all of the abiotic factors in an area. So it's all of the different animals, the different species interacting with the abiotic factors. And what that means, abiotic, when you put A in front of something, that means not. So abiotic is not living, all of the non-living factors in an area. So what are some abiotic factors? Well, that's the air around you, okay? In an, in an ecosystem, that would include things like the water, if there's a pond, if there's a lake, okay? So the ecosystem would include the rocks, the soil, the air, the water, okay? as well as the living organisms interacting with those things, okay? So if I mentioned non-living abiotic things such as river, a lake, you know, multiple animals interacting with those factors, that's now an ecosystem. Then you have the biosphere, and the biosphere refers to a thin zone around the earth, so a thin layer of the earth where all life exists, okay? So if you look at the, the thin layer of the earth where you have all of us living, all the plants, all the animals, that is the biosphere, okay? And then deep, deep below that, you end up with all the things like the, the magma and the hot boiling lava and all that. But the layer where you have all life on Earth, that's the biosphere. So the biosphere is just part of the planet, okay? The last term here that I threw in is important in ecology. It's conservation biology. And those of you interested in the environment, in the planet, in ecology, you may wanna consider a career in conservation biology, which is basically the field where you work to study, preserve, and restore the various parts of ecosystems, of populations, you know, you, you work to preserve and restore the animals and all of those living organisms within the ecosystem, okay? And you even work to preserve the abiotic factors. So for instance, to make sure that the water is clean, okay? The air is cleaner. Because if the air, and the, the air and the water are cleaner, that then helps those organisms that are living there. Okay, so conservation biology is looking to protect and to restore the environment. Okay, the living and the non-living parts of an ecosystem. Okay, so please make sure you know these terminologies on the exams. I can describe something and you should be able to pinpoint whether it's a community, a population, an ecosystem, the biosphere, you know, you should pinpoint whatever I'm talking about. Make sure you know these terms because even if I don't ask directly about them, you will not be able to understand the questions that I'm asking if you can't translate the terms that are part of that question. Now, a big part of studying ecology is to study animals. And some of the things we look at in ecology are the distribution and abundance of animals in various parts of the world. Now, when you see these terms, what they mean is distribution is where you find the animal. Where is it located? Okay, how is something distributed means how is it spread out? Okay, so for instance, the, these figures show the distribution, where you would find the various animals. Abundance is then how much of that particular animal you're seeing, okay? Abundance would be, you know, is an animal in robust amounts or is it getting close to extinction and called endangered? So if something is endangered, that's referring to its abundance. It's in low abundance. Now, the distribution and abundance of animals is part of studying biogeography. And biogeography is basically the study of how organisms are distributed geographically. Okay, so again, these figures would be part of biogeography, 
looking at geographically where the animals end up. Now, distribution and abundance are affected by abiotic and biotic factors. Again, Circle Star highlight the fact that abiotic are non-living factors such as air, water, soil, okay? Whereas biotic factors are living things, okay? Other organisms. So the abiotic factors that I want you to know that influence distribution and abundance are temperature, and moisture, moisture levels, if you're looking at land animals, and salinity, if you're looking at water regions. Okay, so please, for abiotic factors such as what, make sure you write down for this answer, temperature, okay, moisture, meaning water, mean, meaning uh, precipitation levels, if it's land, and salinity, if it's water, meaning how salty is it, okay? And I don't mean like when you're upset with someone and you're salty. I mean how much salt is in that water because certain animals, or, or you know, if you think of fish, for instance, certain fish can only live in high salt, certain fish need no salt or low salt. So the salinity affects which animals will be there and, and you know, how much of them. The biotic factors, that means interactions with living things. So if you think about what living factors, what other animals around them can affect, how many of this animal you'll be able to have there, well, competition and predation are the answers to that second question here. Biotic factors such as competition and predation because animals spread themselves out or pick a location and can get into large numbers if, for instance, they're good competitors, okay? If they're able to outcompete the rest of the animals around them and get the most food, the most resources, nutrients, okay? Whereas predation is a big effector because if there's a lot of predators in an area, then the abundance of the prey is going to drop down. There's going to be fewer and fewer of that prey in that area if there's lots of predators. So you can see having various living factors can influence how many and where you find animals. In addition to studying the animals, a big part of ecology is also studying climate patterns. Now, when we say climate patterns, it's important to know the difference between the term climate versus weather. So uh, an easy way to kind of distinguish between the two is think to yourself, well, weather is what you would see on a weather report, okay? Because weather is the short-term atmospheric conditions. So the short-term temperature, precipitation, sunlight, or wind in a particular area, okay? Short-term meaning the day, the week kind of uh, situation. Whereas climate, climate refers to the prevailing long-term weather conditions. So climate, for instance, is that a tropical region is known to have a hot, very rainy climate, okay? Long-term, the overall consistent kind of weather, okay? Whereas weather itself is just a short-term temporary, you know, what's the temperature, precipitation, sunlight, and wind, okay? So when you hear long-term, you know, what happens every year uh, kind of, situation that would be climate versus weather. Now, you then have to ask yourself, well, why are climates different? Why are some climates so hot, like the, the tropical regions, whereas other areas are quite cold? And basically, the way that that climate is determined is based on the amount of sunlight per unit area that that region gets, 
okay, the amount of sunlight or solar radiation that they're getting. So if they receive a large amount of sunlight, so a direct hit of solar radiation, then they are a warm climate. Whereas if they only receive a small amount of sunlight per, per unit area, then they are a cold climate. So you can see that in the figure here, the angle at which they're getting the sunlight kind of determines are they getting a direct large amount or are they only getting a smaller amount? So you'll see the hottest climates are closer to the equator region, um, the, the closer you get to an equator region, sorry, it's down here in this figure, uh, the more direct the sunlight is. And then you see you get that angling, which is reducing the direct amount of sunlight that you're getting. So the closer you get to the poles, the colder the climate is, the closer to the equator, the hotter that climate is. And it's based on whether or not the sunlight is directly overhead or whether you only have a small amount of sunlight or solar radiation per unit area. Now, there are two, two important terms that I want you to know with regard to climate. There's the Hadley cell term and the Coriolis effect. Now, Hadley cell, even though I wrote it singular here, there's actually more than one Hadley cell. You can see in the figure here, the Hadley cells are shown surrounding the tropics. And the Hadley cells are important because basically there's this major cycling in global air circulation. And you can see that in the Hadley cell diagram here. These arrows are showing air circulation. So it's showing air rising, which is moist, warm air. And then it shows cool air descending downward. Okay, these Hadley cells are basically what's responsible for why the tropics have such high moisture levels. Okay, they have a lot of rain because of this global circulation you see here with the hot air rising, the cold air descending, and as the air is cooling, that's where you get the rain formation occurring. And you see that that rain formation is directly above the tropical regions. Okay, so that's why the tropics are much wetter than the regions near, you know, 30 degrees latitude north and south in the diagram. And ultimately, that's the, you know, the showing that the tropics have a lot more rain, okay, based on the regions uh, with rising air being, you know, ones that have the rain falling closer to them. Okay, so when you hear the Hadley cell, I want you to think that's the air circulation risk that, that's responsible for tropics being rainy, okay? Then you end up also having to know the term Coriolis effect. And the figures on this side of the slide, they demonstrate the Coriolis effect. And that's basically the fact that because the Earth is spinning spinning, 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 okay? Your wind and, uh, wind and current directions end up going back and forth. Kind of picture them as wavy, you know, they're, they're not a straight path. So on this figure, I want you to write above, above or below this, this first globe image. This would be wind and current if there was no Coriolis effect, if the Earth was not spinning, that's what this first picture is. So for this first globe, right, no, if, no, if there was no Coriolis effect, you would have straight wind and currents. So the yellow arrows are showing the wind and the currents. The second globe here is what we actually have. So on this second globe, right, what we actually have Coriolis effect, okay, you end up with different directions or swerving wind and ocean currents, okay?
Now, we've touched upon, you know, what ends up being hotter climates, what ends up being colder climates, but you also have to realize that, you know, climates, you end up with, you know, seasons, right? You, you're you not always in certain locations having just hot, you know, just a hot climate, right? So when you think about climate, I want you to also think about the seasons on Earth and what exactly causes them? The answer to that is the Earth's orbit and tilt. Okay, so here we see in this figure the orbit and the angle at which the Earth is tilted. Now it's important to remember that it's orbit and tilt, not the Earth's distance from the sun because the Earth's distance from the sun stays rather constant, okay? So that's, you know, make sure, you know, it's the orbit and the tilt. And the reason why it's the orbit and tilt creating the seasons at the high latitudes, such as locations where you live right now, is because that ends up giving an annual variation in the amount of solar radiation that the different parts of the world are receiving. Because remember, we said it's, you know, whether or not you're getting direct sunlight, it's that solar radiation that ends up giving you a warm or a cooler climate. And since the Earth has a tilt and it's not just straight up and down, as it goes around its orbit, each location gets a particular amount of sunlight. Okay, at certain times of the year, you end up with a more direct hit of sunlight at certain hemispheres, okay, versus other times of the year where that hemisphere ends up now with a lesser amount of sunlight. It's no longer getting the direct hit of the sun. Okay, so orbit and tilt end up creating the seasons on Earth. Um, and it ultimately creates variation in the amount of solar radiation or sunlight that you're getting at these places. Now, since we're living in New York City, students tend not to think about mountain ranges that much. You know, it's not like if you were in Colorado and you'd look out your window and you see a whole bunch of big, beautiful mountains, unless you, you know, travel upstate New York. Um, in the city, we don't really see that. So you don't tend to think about the fact that mountain ranges can also have a significant impact on climate. And the reason that is, is they create what's called rain shadows. And in the figure here, this area here is the rain shadow. So you see this gray arrow here, you can write that it's pointing to the rain shadow, which is that dry area over here, the desert conditions over here. The reason why the mountain range creates that is kind of like what we talked about before, the idea of how air rises or drops can determine how much precipitation you end up with. So in the previous slides, we saw the Hadley cell, how when air is rising over the tropics, you get a lot of rain. And then once it drops at about 30 degrees north and south of that, you end up with the deserts. So in this idea with mountain ranges now, you get the same thing. Here you have moisture uh, rich air blowing across from, from the oceans. And as the air rises over mountains and, and it cools, the higher that it gets, you end up with a lot of rainfall over that part of the mountain. But then beyond that, it now has to drop, that, that cold air, the cool air drops. And when air is now dropping, you end up with dry conditions. It already gave up all of its moisture in rainfall by that point. So beyond the mountain, you end up with this shadow, they call it a rain shadow, where you have this shadow of dry desert conditions as opposed to the, the area on the other side of the mountain with the high rainfall. Okay. So always remind yourself as air is rising on, you know, in any of these slides, that's when you're gonna get the rainfall. When the cool air then drops, that's when you get 
dry air desert conditions. And in the case of mountain ranges, it's called a rain shadow on that half of the mountain. Now, mountain ranges aren't the only structures that have a huge effect on the climate. Oceans also have a very large effect on climate. What oceans do is they moderate temperature. Okay, so they have a moderating effect on temperature, meaning that they are able to cool down the areas that are near them. The reason that this is, is that water has a high specific heat. So I want you to circle star highlight the fact that water has an extremely high specific heat. What that means is water is capable of holding on to a large amount of heat energy. It can store a ton of heat energy. Okay, that's why it's very, you know, difficult or takes a long time to boil water, for instance. Okay, so it has a very high specific heat. And when you look at that fact, that means that wherever there's water, it's able to hold on to a lot of the heat. And by doing that, it then cools. It means the areas near it are much cooler than areas further away from it because it's holding on and storing and absorbing that that um, that hot that that hot temperature. Okay, so anywhere near water, which I wrote out for you as islands and coastal areas, are going to be much cooler than anything inland, inland being the land further away from the water. And that's why if you've ever taken a walk on the beach or gone near a dock, you'll notice that it's a lot cooler. It's a lot breezier and that you might need, you know, a sweatshirt or a hoodie. Whereas when you're at home away from the water, you notice that it feels a lot warmer to you. OK, so keep in mind that mountains influence climate by influencing precipitation rain, whereas oceans moderate climate, you know, by affecting or influencing the temperature. Okay. Another term that comes up a lot in ecology that you've probably learned about before is the term biome. Okay, biomes are regions characterized by particular abiotic characteristics, meaning particular non-living characteristics. Okay, such as, you know, what kind of soil they have, what kind of air, water presence and all that. And dominant vegetation, meaning which types of plants, plants or trees tend to be found at that location. And by dominant vegetation, we can also mean the lack of, education, uh, of vegetation. So, for instance, certain areas not having as much uh, plant life or having plants that are, you know, used to drier conditions or, or more moisture conditions. That That's all part of the definition of a biome. Now, there are two categories or two types of biomes that I want you to know exist. So for the second question here, there are terrestrial. So that's how you spell terrestrial. There are terrestrial biomes, meaning land biomes, so any of the biomes that you would see where you see land or continents on the map. And then there are aquatic biomes. And aquatic biomes mean any of the water locations. So as you can see here, things like freshwater biome or marine biome, those are aquatic. Okay, so there are two main types or big categories of biomes. There are terrestrial and there are uh, aquatic. And we're going to briefly talk about each of those types. The first one being the terrestrial or land biomes. When I say what abiotic factors influence terrestrial biomes, that means what non-living factors influence these land biomes. Okay, and land biomes include things like the tropical rainforests. Okay, temperate forests, deserts, tundra, taiga, grassland, savanna, all of those are terrestrial biomes. Now, the abiotic factors that influence those biomes, there are four that I want you to remember. There's temperature, moisture, sunlight, and wind. 
Okay, so for terrestrial biomes, the abiotic factors that influence them are temperature, so how hot or cold it is, moisture, is it very rainy, such as the tropical rainforest biome, or is it very dry, like the desert biome? Sunlight and wind also influences how windy is it, okay, how much direct sunlight gets there, and all of those things end up influencing the wildlife. So the abiotic factors not only help define these biomes, but they help characterize which animals, which plant life will be able to survive in those locations as well. Now, as mentioned, in addition to the terrestrial biomes, we also have aquatic biomes. And like I said in the previous slide, make sure you write down that the two main types of aquatic biomes are freshwater, is one, and the second one is marine, okay? Marine water being the, the biomes that have a lot of salt water, okay? And the abiotic factors that influence the aquatic biome will be slightly different from the terrestrial ones. So the abiotic factors for aquatic biomes that I want you to write down are salinity, meaning how much salt. So salinity, water depth, how deep does that water biome go? Sunlight, meaning the sunlight availability. Water flow, water flow being, is it a very fast rushing waterway or is it completely still and not flowing? And lastly, nutrient availability. Okay, how many nutrients are in that location? So for aquatic biomes, make sure you wrote down five abiotic factors affecting aquatic biomes, which are salinity, water depth, sunlight, water flow, and nutrient availability. Now, there are some other terms that I want you to know when we talk about aquatic biomes. The first one is the intertidal zone. The intertidal zone is basically the rocky shoreline, sandy beach, or the mud flat that is exposed to the air when you have a low tide and you don't see the intertidal zone when there is a high tide because it's basically covered up. Okay, so that rocky shoreline or the, the very, you know, sandy beach that gets covered by high tide. The second term here, the neuritic zone, I want you to know the continental shelf and coral reef within that. The neuritic zone basically goes further from the intertidal zone to depths of about 200 meters. And the continental shelf is the, the gentle sloping or submerged portion of a continental plate. And this will be the outermost edge definition of the neuritic zone. Okay, so you can put the continental shelf is the outermost edge that defines the neuritic zone. You also have coral reefs there, and coral reefs are important because that's a habitat for many organisms. Okay. In addition to those first two zones, there's also the oceanic zone, and this one, very easy to define because it says ocean in it. So the oceanic zone, you're now further away from the shoreline and you are out in the open ocean. So the oceanic zone is beyond that continental shelf, that, that neuritic zone, and is the open ocean. And at the bottom of the ocean, open ocean, all that mud where you have little creatures digging within the depths of the bottom floor of the ocean, that is the benthic zone, okay? So benthic is the muddy ocean floor, okay? The photic zone, okay, photic, basically think sunlight. The photic zone is the intertidal and sunlit regions of any of the other zones that we talked about. So the photic zone is wherever sunlight reaches. And then below that is the aphotic zone. And again, anytime you see A in front of a word in biology, that means no. So if this photic zone is the sunlight region, 
any part of the aquatic biome where sunlight hits, then the aphotic zone is the region where sunlight does not reach, okay? Sunlight does not hit it. Okay, please be very comfortable with each of these terms, what they mean, and for instance, the fact that these two terms are part of the neritic zone. Now, when you think of ecology, you think of all of these beautiful environments and, and this gorgeous nature. And unfortunately, we also have to look at the human impact on this you know, beautiful planet and on all of these biomes that we're talking about. Now, there are impacts on both kinds of biomes. There's human impacts on terrestrial biomes and also on aquatic biomes. And so basically think to yourself, what have humans done that affects, you know, all of these different parts of nature, all of these different environments? And so when it comes to terrestrial biomes, humans have unfortunately been, you know, famous for changing terrestrial landscapes, changing the, the land around them and creating what we call anthropogenic biomes, okay? Anthropogenic, that term, circle star highlight, this whole term here, anthromes, anthropogenic biomes. Anthropogenic means originating from human activities. So when humans do things that, you know, change what these biomes look like, they end up creating anthromes or, you know, man-made biomes. And what we mean by that are things such as cities, farms, ranch lands, all of these things in place of natural biomes, in place of all of the trees and nature that used to be there. So when you think of anthromes, think of man-made biomes such as cities and farms that have, you know, taken, taken the place, you know, pioneered by man to to be these new locations now amazingly more than 75 percent of earth's ice-free land has been modified in some way or another by humans whether it's you know making these cities and these farmlands and and, and you know changing all of this land or you know things like logging things like urban development, or as you can see in, in these pictures, whether it's aquatic or terrestrial, humans pollute. We've polluted the, the earth so much that that affects all the biomes, okay? Not just the terrestrial ones. So unfortunately, the human impact on biomes on both the terrestrial and the aquatic ones has been pretty bad, really, really bad. On the aquatic and so terrestrial impact has been building things like cities and farms and, you know, destroying the land in that way. On the aquatic end, there's been a few different things that humans have done that ended up changing or influencing and messing up, really, aquatic biomes. For instance, all of the filling and, and draining of wetlands and, you know, removing these water areas to, again, create their own construction, things like massive dams that they've built that modify these aquatic biomes. Humans have also done things like created, you know, reservoirs or decorative you know, recreational ponds and lakes and made whole drainage systems. So they've modified aquatic biomes in that way too. And then of course, the movement of organisms. We, we've ended up, you know, affecting biomes, especially the aquatic ones, by transporting organisms. An example that your textbook gives is the invasive zebra mussel. Okay, once you, you've transported these, these organisms into a place where they're not part of the natural food chain, everything ends up getting messed up. And then, of course, as you can see, again, in these figures, a big part of the human impact on aquatic biomes has been all of the pollution. So, for instance, what you've been seeing in a lot of memes and on the news lately are the, the straws 
and the effects that they have. But even before that, you constantly saw the human pollution effect in terms of things like uh, the the soda can plastics and and all of the the waste that we produce that gets into the waterways and has a huge impact on the lives of anything living in those aquatic biomes unfortunately so the impact has been really bad and i really want you to know anthropomes or anthropogenic biomes man-made biomes such as cities farms when we really change the the environmentally natural biomes to make them human made. So now we're going to move forward from general ecology and I want you to focus now on behavioral ecology and please always make sure whenever I give definitions especially to terms in red make sure you carefully write them down even if you have to rewind a little replay uh, because those usually end up on exams or help you understand questions later on. Now, in order to understand behavioral ecology, you first have to know what exactly is a behavior. And a behavior is an action. In other words, it is a response to a stimulus. Okay, so there are a lot of different behaviors. And when you then study the behavioral adaptations that have evolved in response specifically to ecological stimuli, or ecological selection pressures, that's behavioral ecology, okay? So behavior is an action, particularly a response to a stimulus. And when you then study the, the behavioral adaptations or the responses to ecological stimuli, that's behavioral ecology. Now, when we talk about behavioral ecology, I want you to know the difference between proximate causation and ultimate causation, which are two things that we study when we're talking about behavioral um, ecology. Proximate causation will basically explain something using genetics or molecular neurological, the, the real scientific um, mechanisms that are involved. So if you're looking at a cause of a behavior and you are explaining it with genetic pathways or neurological pathways, you are looking at the proximate causation of that behavior, okay? The proximate causes of that particular behavior. If instead you are looking at the evolutionary causes of that behavior, meaning why the action occurs based on history and evolutionary consequences such as natural selection, then you are looking at the ultimate causation. Okay, so for, the, for these two, make sure for proximate, you write biological, genetic, neurological explanations, whereas for ultimate, write evolutionary explanations such as survival of the fittest or adaptations. Okay, so the example that you see in this figure is looking at the proximate cause and the ultimate cause of the behavioral action of these little geese following their mother. Okay, so the proximate cause is the biological, genetic, or molecular neurological explanation so you see the developmental stage, things like, you know, the Hox genes that we talked about in the past and neurological development, those causes, if you're using those causes to explain and describe this scenario, then you're looking at proximate causation. If instead you're looking at the survival of the fittest, those little geese that are closest to mom have the best survival chances and that's why they stay close to her, that is an ultimate cause. Okay, so both explain the behavior, both can be correct. It's just a matter of what you are studying at that moment. Now, when we talk about behaviors and behavioral things, a lot of behaviors are flexible, okay? There's different levels of flexibility in your behaviors. So the very flexible kind of behaviors we call conditional 
are basically things that can be learned. So the classic example that you see in this figure of a flexible behavior is lever pulling. So when they do those experiments where when the lab rat pulls a lever or pushes a button, it gets a treat, it gets rewarded. So over time, it learns to do that behavior. That is a flexible behavior because it didn't have that behavior to begin with. Okay, it's kind of like if you don't study for a test and you fail and then you start studying more and more and you realize, wow, when I study, when I listen to the professor, oh, I actually get better grades. I love that feeling of getting an A now, of getting 100 on the test. So I'm going to keep doing that. That's flexible behavior. You learn to do that. Some behaviors, are, however, are what we call FAPs, okay? FAP, and that stands for Fixed Action Patterns, and you see that on this graph here. Fixed Action Patterns are behaviors that are innate, meaning inborn. They're natural. They always stay the same, okay? They're highly inflexible, okay? meaning they're highly not flexible, okay? And, and those are behaviors that will be performed the same way every time. It did not have to be learned. It's kind of like a reflex. So for instance, the example they use here is jump back behavior in kangaroo rats, which is basically these kangaroo rats from birth, from, from early development, if they hear the sound of a rattlesnake, they naturally jump back they they jump away from the direction of that rattlesnake sound of that that stimulus okay they're just born with that it's a survival mechanism there's no learning it is fixed action it happens the same way every time they hear that snake rattle its tail okay so whenever you hear the term fap in my class at least always think fixed action patterns not flexible, you are born with it, as opposed to flexible conditional behaviors. Okay, and I want you to circle, star, highlight conditional for flexible. Okay, that's conditioned learned behavior. As we just mentioned, a lot of behaviors are flexible, they're learned. And the way that they end up learned or kind of carrying on throughout generations is often based on choice and trade-offs, specifically what you're gonna hear as fitness trade-offs and the, the cost-benefit analysis that an organism has to do when it's deciding to do that behavior. Now, the first term that you see here, fitness trade-off, what that means is when you are going to do a behavior, when you're considering this behavior, a lot of behaviors will have different costs or benefits, but a lot of times those costs or those, those benefits that you might get from doing that behavior end up coming at a cost to your fitness, meaning you may have some benefit by doing this behavior, but it might cost you, you might lose some of your fitness. You might be hurting your fitness, okay? And when we say fitness, we don't mean gains at the gym, bro. What we mean by fitness, anytime we talk about that in my course, we mean your evolutionary advantage, your ability to survive and to reproduce, okay? Because that's the ultimate goal in evolution. Now, with this concept that you end up having fitness trade-offs, meaning you have potential losses to your fitness at a cost, you know, costing you fitness despite the benefit of that behavior, whenever you do a behavior or you're considering a behavior, you ultimately have to keep in mind the cost-benefit analysis, okay? Behavioral ecologists use this from e economics to basically understand and, and quantify behavioral choices that animals make. And ultimately, cost and benefit to an animal is measured based on how that behavior will impact your fitness, your ability to survive and reproduce, okay? 
what you have to keep in mind when doing cost benefit uh, analyses is that these are not, you know, even though the way we're just talking about it, it's as if you're really thinking through this behavior, analyzing every cost, every benefit. Usually these choices are actually not conscious. Okay, it's subconscious, you kind of just make the, the decision of your behavior, but subconsciously, without realizing it, you're, you're weighing. What's the benefit going to be? What's it going to cost me? And ultimately, because they're flexible learned behaviors, they can vary from organism to organism, so they're not always going to be the same. Now, the five most prominent challenges to organismal behavior requiring this kind of analysis. We're gonna go through each one in the upcoming slides, but make sure you list them out here. The five most prominent challenges are choosing feeding, meaning what, how, and when you are going to eat. The second one is choosing a mate, okay? The third one is choosing a place to live Next one, the fourth one, is communicating with others. And the fifth one is cooperating with others. And some of us, like myself, have a problem with all five of these. But <laughs> moving on, we're going to go one by one through each of these challenges and what goes into making these behaviors and choices. The first challenge that all animals have to face is choosing food. Okay, and the term that you see here, foraging, that's the fancy scientific way. So this term here, foraging, that's the fancy scientific way of saying looking for food. Okay, looking for food. Now, behavioral ecologists have mapped out the optimal theory of foraging. And what that basically is, is a theory that predicts that animals will make their food seeking decisions based on being able to maximize their gain in energy while minimizing energy loss. Okay, so your goal in the optimal theory of foraging is to gain as much energy as possible while minimizing any energy loss. So for instance, the energy, you, you don't want to use a lot of energy to get that food, because then that cancels out the energy you're gonna gain from the food. So things that factor into this is time spent, you know, looking for that food, the risk of predators catching you while you're trying to get that food, for instance. So basically the dangers that you, you are put into. An example that your textbook uses is basically gerbils Okay, gerbils or little rodents have to balance the benefit of foraging for food. So going out looking for food with the cost and the cost meaning the risk of exposure to owls. Okay, so they have to kind of juggle the fact that, yes, I want to go out there. I want to go find myself some food. But when I do this, I have to be careful because I'm now making myself at risk for predators. Okay, so you try and, and seek out food in the best way to reduce your risks or reduce your costs while maximizing the benefit, how much food and nutrients and energy you will get out of this search. Another important behavior choice that animals have to make is choosing a mate. Now, when it comes to choosing a mate, just like with any of the other behaviors we're talking about, an animal basically has to weigh the cost versus the benefit and in their decision, in their sexual activities and, and actions. And, you know, many people basically say all behavior really revolves around food or sex. So choosing a mate ends up being a very prominent choice and behavior in the animal kingdom. Now, what actually causes the onset or beginning, you know, the, the start for an, an animal to undergo sexual behavior. Well, the proximate cause, again, when you see proximate, think biological, genetic, hormonal, um, neurological cause, 
That is the sex hormones. So testosterone in males and estradiol in females, or you can think of it as estrogen. So testosterone and estrogen, the sex hormones is the proximate cause of the onset of sexual behavior. And these, you know, hormonal causes of onset of sexual behavior are also influenced by environmental cues. So for instance, uh, spring, certain animals, spring will trigger the release or production of those hormones and social cues also. So when you see mating rituals in the animal world, kind of like you see with this guy here puffing out his chest or the bobbing head that you sometimes see uh, certain female species, uh, certain females in particular bird species, they bob their head in kind of a, almost like a dance-like, uh, dance-like kind of manner. You can think of it as like a seductive kind of little mating ri ritual. So when you think of the proximate cause of sexual behavior being the sex hormones, also realize that the environment and the social cues influence those sex hormones. Now, when you think about choosing a mate, please remember that the female gender ha in, in the animal kingdom has the selection advantage because when you are looking at choosing a mate and you are thinking of the benefit of reproduction versus what it's costing you to undergo you know, that reproduction and what you're losing for females in the animal kingdom, they get to be more picky because reproduction has a much greater cost for the female. You know, think about it. They expend a lot more energy and resources because they're the one that's getting pregnant. And that even puts them at risk for things like pre predators, you know, during that time that they're vulnerable, depending on how long they stay pregnant. So females have the selective advantage or the selection advantage when it comes to choosing a mate. The next choice that's very important for behavior is also choosing a place to live. And what's interesting about this is in order to choose a place to live, animals get to navigate. And there are three ways that they can navigate. There's piloting, there's compass orientation, and there's true navigation, which we also call map orientation. So piloting is when an animal will use familiar landmarks that will help them locate, let's say, the place that they chose to live. Okay, it's kind of when you tell someone, oh yeah, if you want to get to my house, you take a right at the McDonald's and then a left at, you know, the JC Penny, and you use these familiar landmarks in that neighborhood to help guide a person. So using those familiar landmarks would be piloting. The second way of navigation is compass orientation. And think of it like you're using a compass. It is any movement that is oriented in a specific direction. Okay. And, you know, the a lot of animals, you might think of it as using the sun location as their navigation, but that actually ends up being kind of difficult because as you know, the, the sun's position changes during the day. So in order to use the sun or the sky as any kind of compass, a lot of animals rely on their circadian clock. And what the circadian clock is basically your 24 hour rhythm of chemical activity that lets you distinguish between time of day and time of night. Okay, so very valuable for you to use. And you've probably heard circadian clock or circadian rhythm in relation to chemicals such as melatonin that some people end up taking as supplements, which I do not recommend because if you take supplemental form of melatonin, you become dependent on it because your body now loses its ability to properly produce and regulate melatonin. So if you can avoid it, please avoid ever starting yourself on melatonin supplements, even though 
it's advertised as, oh, this is natural, so it's safe and healthy. It's not a good idea. Okay. The third form of navigation is true navigation. And that's basically being able to locate a specific place on Earth's exact surface, basically as if the Earth is a map. Okay. So three forms of navigation, piloting, compass orientation, and true navigation. The fourth behavior that animals need is communication with others. And when it comes to communication, the first thing is to understand, well, what does that mean? Communication is basically the process where a signal from one individual modifies the behavior of a recipient individual. And it's a very important part of animal behavior, okay? C communication is critical. And it's ultimately creating a, you know, stimulus that elicits a response, some sort of response. Now, for communication to occur, it's not enough to just send out the signal. The signal has to be received and acted on. So there has to be a resulting act, a response from that communication. So for instance, all the people who have ghosted me, they did not actually have communication, okay? If it's not two ways, it's not communication. Now, there are many ways that animals can communicate. They basically, you know, when you think of communication, a lot of you just think, oh, that's easy. The only, you know, sense that you're using or, or what you're doing is sound, right? You're just, you know, talking. That's communication. Wrong. Animals communicate with touch, sounds, scent, and sight. Okay, depending on the environment that they're in. So make sure you write that down. It is touch, sound, scent, and sight that can all be used for communication. Okay, it is not just verbal. And what's interesting is that in nature, communication can be honest or deceitful, just like with humans. Okay, it can be honest. For instance, the, the textbook example that I love is bees and their little waggle wiggle dance. You know, when they direct the hive to food, they're being honest with their hive because those are their kin. That's their family. They want to direct them to food. So when they communicate the location of food, bees are being honest with each other. There are also deceitful communications, okay? And that can be an adaptive, you know, beneficial trait, especially when it's rare. The examples that are really cool with that is the idea of, for instance, playing dead or mimicry. So for instance, if an animal plays dead, it's communicating with a predator, but in a deceitful way, it's tricking them. Or mimicry, you know, some of the textbooks will show you pictures of, for instance, fish that will be patterned to look like the female of their species, even though they're actually male, because that mimicry that communicates that they're female to others, even though they're male, so that now they're safe from the aggressive competition and they could get around and sneak around and mate with the females despite, you know, the, the other males around. Okay, so communication can be a very interesting thing and please make sure you write on this slide that communication can be honest with the example of the bees, the bee dance, or deceitful. And the example of deceitful communication I want you to know is playing dead or mimic, being a mimic, M-I-M-I-C. Okay, so very interesting communication between animals. The last type of behavior that I want to go over with you is cooperation with others. Now what's interesting with the behavior of cooperating with others is that all the different types of behavior that we've reviewed so far, they all had a common key element to them. In all of the other behaviors we've discussed, we're looking at individuals responding 
to an environmental stimulus in a way that ultimately increases their fitness, you know, makes their chances of survival or getting a mate and reproducing, passing on their genes better. But there is an interesting example in cooperating with others that goes against that idea, that contradicts that pattern, and that is altruism. And altruism is interesting. It's basically a behavior that has a fitness cost for whichever you know individual is is performing that altruism. Okay, so with altruism, it's basically, you know, a scientific way of saying self-sacrificing behavior because altruism is an action that decreases your own individual ability to produce offspring or to have fitness, but helps others produce offspring or have fitness. Okay, so altruism is helping others at a cost to yourself. And what's, you know, what's interesting with that is it's, it, it basically shows that for the individual, altruism hurts their fitness. Okay, so for the individual, altruism is decreasing your chance of survival or your chance of fitness, your chance of having offspring, but it's doing that at the same time that it's helping the population, okay? So it decreases the individual's fitness, but increases the population's fitness. So make sure you write that down. Altruism, what does it do? Ultimately, for the individual and the population, Altruism decreases the fitness for the individual while increasing the fitness for the population. And there's what's called Hamilton's rules. Okay? Hamilton's rules to kind of tell you when is altruism most likely. Well, it's most likely when three conditions are met, okay? For altruism to be most likely, the fitness benefits should be high for the recipient, okay, the, the person or the population getting the benefits should, the, the benefit should be high for the recipient. The altruist and the recipient, so the one doing the good deed and the one receiving the good deed, are close relatives, what we call kin, K-I-N, and the fitness cost to the altruist is low. Okay, so altruism is most likely, basically to summarize those three conditions, altruism is most likely to occur if the person you're helping is related to you, if they are going to get a lot of benefit while you are having the least cost or least, you know, hurt possible from that situation. Okay, and that makes sense, you know, because ultimately what we call uh, kin selection occurs in biology. So K-I-N selection, meaning, you know, natural selection basically acts through benefiting relatives because your relatives share the same or similar genes as you. And if the ultimate goal in biology and ecology and evolution is to pass on your genes, it does not necessarily have to be 100% just you. It can be you helping pass on your genes by helping close relatives because they're sharing the same genes. You know, you and your siblings have a whole bunch of similar, you know, shared same genes. You and your cousins. So if you're helping them to succeed and have good fitness and pass on their genes, then your genes are technically being passed on as well. And the most extreme form of altruism is what you see here is eusociality. And that's basically, you know, this extreme form, kind of like you see in bees. So with bees, you know, everyone gives up their own reproduction and direct offspring abilities to instead care for the queen's offspring. 
Okay, so that's going to be the most extreme form of altruism, where these organisms completely give up their own ability to have offspring to pass on their own individual genes and dedicate their life to helping raise and, and ensure passing on the genes of the queen. So eusociality in bees is the most extreme form of altruism. Now, when we talk about kin selection, it's important to really understand the aspect of fitness because, you know, again, fitness is not all about the gains, bro. We're talking about fitness in the biology sense, in the sense of passing on your genes, having offspring to pass on those genes. And so there are a few terms I want you to be aware of. When it comes to fitness, you can either have direct personal fitness or you can have indirect fitness. And that's kind of what we've been touching upon in the previous slide. Direct fitness is your own production of offspring, passing on your genes directly through your own offspring. Whereas indirect fitness is when you help your relatives produce offspring. So you're helping your overall population, you know, have an increase in your related genes, <clears throat> okay? And so when we talk about that idea of direct fitness and of indirect fitness, you know, either yourself or your relatives, so direct is yourself, indirect is your relatives, you come up with the concept of inclusive fitness. And inclusive fitness is just basically adding direct fitness or combining direct fitness with indirect fitness, okay? So it combines the aspect of helping relatives produce offspring with the aspect of helping yourself produce offspring and pass on your genes. Now that kin selection that I mentioned in the previous slide, when you are now helping, um, you know, your relatives, at the expense of yourself, okay? What that is doing, because I said at the expense of yourself, that means you're decreasing your direct fitness. So you're reducing your chances of producing your own offspring, passing on your own complete genes by increasing the indirect fitness, okay? So at the same time that you're hurting your direct fitness, hurting your own chances of offspring, you are helping your relatives. So you are increasing indirect fitness, increasing the chance of your relatives producing offspring and passing on the related genes, okay? And because that's usually such a sharp increase in indirect fitness, kin selection overall increases inclusive fitness because inclusive fitness takes into account both the direct and the indirect fitness. So please make sure you're very comfortable distinguishing between what's direct, what's indirect, what does inclusive mean, and how does kin selection affect each of these. Now, when it comes to cooperating with others, you may ask yourself, well, all of this is talking about, you know, doing something good for relatives, which I could understand, because, right, if you're helping your relatives out, you're helping, that's, that's family, that's blood, that's your own genes, you're basically helping yourself out. But you may ask yourself, does that ever happen when someone's not related, when, when animals are not related to each other? And, you know, <clears throat> When you think of that as basically the idea of saying, would you sacrifice yourself for someone who's not related to you? And the easy way to kind of answer this concept is to think about yourself. What motivates you to help others? And unfortunately, the answer is usually, what do I get out of it? Right? So many times, if you're, if you're asked to do something or you you're gonna to have to put in ex any extra effort. Most of the time, unfortunately, people think, well, I wanna get something out of it, otherwise I'm not wasting my time. Ain't nobody got time for that. Remember that meme? Well, unfortunately, that's how a lot of people think. And so when you look at the idea of cooperating with others when you're not related, it's 
usually only happens with what we call reciprocal altruism. Okay, so that's basically helping someone who is not related to you because you are going to get something in return. Basically, reciprocal altruists help individuals who have either helped them in the past or are likely to help them in the future. It's basically when students want extra credit for doing anything. Okay, I don't want to do it if I'm not getting anything out of it, right? So we call that in ecology reciprocal altruism. Okay, reciprocal altruism is when an individual will help those who either help them in the past or are likely to help them in the future, where you're getting something out of this. And now there's also um, other terms that are important when we talk about cooperation and mutualism. We have the idea of um, we, we have these ideas that you have to distinguish from altruism, and sometimes it's a little tough to tell the difference. But the key here, in altruism or in reciprocal altruism, you are doing something to help others, and ultimately it is decreasing your own fitness. So in the case of reciprocal altruism, yes, you may be getting something out of it because that individual is going to help you, you know, in the future or helped you in the past, but ultimately, whatever you're doing is decreasing your own fitness, okay? The difference with cooperation and mutualism is that helping others in these two cases is not decreasing your fitness. Instead, it is increasing your own fitness too, okay? So cooperation and mutualism, you are helping others increase their fitness in a way that increases your own fitness as well, okay? And the difference between those two terms, cooperation and mutualism, please write down that cooperation is if it's within the same species, okay? So within the same species, that's cooperation. If it's different species, it's mutualism. And in both of these cases, the key idea is that everyone benefits, the person or the individual that's getting helped and the individual giving the help. They're both increasing their benefit. And a way that you can think of it is seen in this figure here, the idea of African wild dogs. Okay, they're not capable of hunting large prey individually by themselves. So if you have one African wild dog, it's not going to be able to hunt large prey alone. But they can succeed if they hunt as a pack. So they're helping each other hunt, increase each other's fitness, but it also increases their own fitness because they are not capable of catching that prey alone. Okay, and since they are all the same species, these are all African wild dogs, that is an example of cooperation, okay, not mutualism. Mutualism is if it was, you know, these African wild dogs working alongside a lion to help take down the prey, okay? So please make sure you're able to distinguish between the terminology. Now that is it for today. So before you go, I wanted to hit you with one more Remind app question. So please send me the answer immediately so that you do not forget to do this, okay? It is from this lecture. I purposely didn't put it directly after the appropriate slide so that you kind of get the feel of true practice, okay? If you have any questions, please contact me as always. And that is it. Again, please make sure you send me that Remind answer. And as always, any questions, any concerns, contact me in the Remind app day or night. Never worry about bothering me. Please don't think that, you know, if it's in the middle of the night when you happen to be going over this lecture, it's not going to wake me up. I turn that, you know, notification off. But in the morning, I'll be able to check it right away and get back to you. Okay, so please have a wonderful day and thank you for listening to this lecture.